Um, so I think about that a lot because I also think about ever since I moved back to West Virginia, um, going from corporate hospitals into public health mm -hmm. really made me think about what is your legacy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what is it that when you leave, if you're going to work this hard, yes. what is your legacy at the end of the day? Welcome to Leadership Rediscovered. I'm your host, Laura Siebold, and today I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Sarah Woodrum. Dr. Sarah Woodrum serves as the Senior Associate Dean and more recently the Interim Dean at the West Virginia University School of Public Health in Morgantown, West Virginia. In this role, Dr. Woodrum oversees the day-to-day -day operations and strategic administration of the school. In addition, she works on policy development and problem resolution and provides administrative oversight and direction in the areas of finance, research, fundraising and development, marketing and communications, and information technology. In addition to these responsibilities, which are many, Dr. Woodrum spends a great deal of time focused on community engagement on behalf of the university, but also because of her own desire to give back. Finally, Dr. Woodrum teaches leadership courses in the Department of Health Policy, Management, and Leadership. She has more than two decades of healthcare management and strategic operations experience. Dr. Woodrum is a West Virginia native who returned to the state in 2013 to serve as the Chief Administrative Officer for the WVU School of Medicine and has maintained a faculty appointment in the School of Public Health since that time. In between the School of Medicine and School of Public Health administrative roles, she served as the Chief Operating Officer at Mon Health Medical Center, a 189-bed community hospital in Morgantown from 2015 to 2017. Reporting to the CEO of the hospital, Woodrum have responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of all hospital-based services, including patient care, nursing, medical affairs, quality of care, and information systems, which all reported to her. Prior to returning to Morgantown, Dr. Woodrum was a vice president of North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois, where she was responsible for the Department of Surgery, Department of Anesthesia, and Division of Cardiology. And before that, she worked in various administrative capacities within the Northwestern Medical Faculty Foundation, Northwestern Memorial Hospital, and the BJC Health System in St. Louis. Dr. Woodrum holds a bachelor's degree from the Uni University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a master's degree in health systems management from Rush University in Chicago, and a doctor <laughs> of public health from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Very impressive, which is why I'm excited. Very dramatic to talk to you. reading that you did. I think there's it really nothing dramatic added. about me. What are you talking about? <laughs> I think it really added to my intro. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I am available anytime you need an introduction. I'm that. happy to do it for I'm you. I'm definitely going to need that. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You are a very successful leader, and I hear your name all the time. I think we were joking about yeah. this the last, when we first <clears> met. It's like every week, somehow your name comes up and see there's someone telling me you have to have her on the podcast or just something good that you're doing in the community at large as well as in the university. So I feel like Thank you. we can go in Thanks. so many different directions here. But let's just start, introduce people who don't know you. T take us through your leadership journey. I think that's a good starting point. Okay. Well, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I'll do a summary of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> First of all, thank you. Yes, I agree. Morgantown is um, a big place, but it's also a small place. So yeah. it's interesting because there's so many connections where yes. we overlap. And after we met and we started talking, I mean, it's just interesting, not only from a professional world, mm -hmm. but from a personal world, how many connections we right. have. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's a big part of community engagement. And yes. we can talk about that later. But um, yeah, I'm a Morgantown native. I, um, I grew up here. Um, I literally grew up here. I went to um, North Elementary. Oh, and wow. what you didn't mention that I should have put in my bio is I was in the first graduating class at North Elementary. Wow. Yeah, so that's kind of my claim to fame that I went to Morgantown High. I actually um, left when I was 18. I, I don't know if a lot of 18-year-olds feel this way, but I couldn't wait to get the heck out of Morgantown. <laughs> and I, I always say this now. I'm like, you can't wait to get away from home and yes. then I think that when you have your own kids and your parents are aging mm -hmm. and you get to a point in your life where it's time to come home and you're excited about coming home yeah 
But at that point, I was, um, I think where I got involved with community organizations was I was very lucky and I got a Rotary scholarship to go to Australia for a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I went as a Rotary Exchange student sponsored by Rotary Club of Morgantown. Very cool. Yeah. So it all comes back around. Yes. Now this is all making sense to why you're so involved in Rotary. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So I really felt like I wanted to give back after that. So I had a wonderful year. I went to Perth, Australia. It was the year the America's Cup was there. Oh, my goodness. I um, lived with three different host families okay. and just had a wonderful experience. And, you know, it was back before, like, we could FaceTime our parents. And, I mean, oh I was gosh, writing really letters. Away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> writing letters. And, um, unfortunately, you know, they couldn't come and see me for yeah. the whole year. It was weird. Were you in college? What, what's your age? So I was 18. 18. So okay. I just wow. finished Morgantown High. Then I did that wow. as kind of a gap year. Okay. And, um yeah, it is weird to think about. Like, I can't imagine now that I have a son who's 18 mm-hmm. and going to college. Just shipping him yeah. away to Australia. I'm just, like, thinking I'll be lucky to get him to the dorms. <laughs> but, like, to get him to go overseas for a year yeah. without seeing us would yeah. probably... It's just a different world. It is a different world. Yeah, but that was a great experience. And um, as part of the exchange, when you're with Rotary, you um, when you're there for the year, I went to the Rotary meetings every week. And, um, and so saw, like, kind of the community service they do and their motto is service above self which we can talk about with the community engagement but anyway I came back and I went literally I got back in August that following year and I went straight like I was two weeks in Morgantown I went straight to the University of Illinois my goodness yeah and had a wonderful time there Um, went up to Rush University in Chicago Mm -hmm. and did a master's there and um, then went to St. Louis and did a postgraduate fellowship for a couple of years. Wow. And that's part of the Washington University system in St. Louis. And then oh, okay. I thought about staying there, but I really liked Chicago. Thought about coming back this way, but I happened to get a job offer at Northwestern and then was able to start my doctorate degree at the same time. Okay. And I actually, one of my first jobs was working nights and weekends at the hospital as the off-shift administrator. Ooh. And... That because I always thought I wanted to get my doctorate degree, do health policy. Um, with the job I took at Northwestern, the first one was as a senior associate to the president and CEO. And I was writing his kind of board briefs, and he was very involved with the American Hospital Association, so writing his legislative updates. Wow. And I loved that, but I just couldn't get through school fast enough. And mm. this is long before um, Zoom and remote classes. Oh, yeah. The only way I could get through was to um, go to work at night and weekends and um, go to school during the day. And not sleep. (laughs) And not sleep. But I ended up falling in love with hospital operations. Well, can I just ask, though, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, It's so fascinating to me, though, because how did you even get interested in this world? Very good question. Yeah, because it is very specific. Like, you grow up and you're like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a policeman. Yeah, but I don't hear But I don't hear a lot of people. (laughs) Really? That is shocking to me. (laughs) Other than maybe you. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, she's weird. Um, I grew up in a family of healthcare professionals. Okay. And so my dad was a hospital administrator. Okay. My... um, my parents have been divorced for a long time, which is part of my journey. Um, but they've both been remarried for 35 plus years. Wow. And so they both have spouses that have been in. Both of their spouses are healthcare administrators. Okay. So my mom married Jeez. another one. I'm like, <laughs> okay, you didn't learn the first time. Right, now like, you gotta do let's it again. go marry another one. Wow. Yeah. So there's just a lot of healthcare talk. And actually, yeah. when I got to U of I, I went into business. Okay. And I just had a really hard time. Like, business, my son's going into business next year. That's what he's declared his major. And I'm like, you get there and you're kind of like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like, I needed a specific, specific industry to focus on. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and I'm not clinical. I I, there's nothing clinical about me. <laughs> I don't do clinical things at all, not even at home <laughs> or with dog poop. <laughs> uh, not, yeah, not, not your jam. <laughs> not me. Mm-mm. So anyway, so yeah, it was kind of a natural thing. Okay. And there was no pressure. My dad all the, all the way said, don't do it. But don't you probably got in. to see a realistic preview of what it would be like. I did. I did, which is interesting because both of my parents... My mom actually still holds this against me. She's in higher education. She actually worked at West Virginia University as oh, a professor. Wow. Um, in spe- and she specializes in special education. But I always said, 
I'm going to do what dad does because you work really hard and don't get paid very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so she still is like very bitter about that. And I'm like, that's a really hard job. And it, it is. doesn't seem like a glamorous life. Yeah. 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 Way, way harder. So, but anyway, no, it was good for that reason. And it is something that, um, and my dad and I, our personalities are pretty similar, gotcha. so it kind of makes seems sense. Like it works for him. It's probably going to, you know, maybe work for me, too. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was in Chicago for, well, I guess I was in the Midwest for about 27 years. I wow. worked in the Northwestern system for 18. Very stressed out. I, I realize in retrospect, um, married someone who became a partner at Ernst & Young. Oh, wow. And That's travels a, a lot. Career too. And doing a dual career um family thing doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily work. And I'm not sure we ever really sat down and had that talk about like whose career mm-hmm. takes precedent. Mm-hmm. And so that was really hard because it was just sort of like he left on Sunday or Monday and all of a sudden I'm like, I have one kid, then two, and I'm vice president um, working over four hospitals up there. And in Chicago, to get to a 7 a.m. meeting, you pretty much had to leave by 5.30 in the morning, wow. and you were stressed yes. getting there. Yes. I mean, you didn't know if you were going to make it because of traffic. Jeez. So, yeah, when, like, nannies and babysitters stop answering your calls, <laughs> you're like, to I'm going to house at block the number <laughs> and then call them and see if they answer. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. It was a big move back. It was not easy. I just decided... Um, Morgan, I looked at several jobs, you know, all over the country. And when this one came up in Morgantown, the dean who had been at school of medicine had come from Chicago. Okay. So I had met him before. He knew I was from Morgantown. He had okay. reached out to me about this job as the chief administrative officer for the school of medicine. And I came to look at it. It was a great offer. Um, it was just made sense. And um, I just said, I'm doing it. I'm just doing it. It was definitely... Um, a rocky road, I think, um, with the dual career thing. Mm-hmm. But my opinion was, this is what works best for me and for the kids. And yes. I have family support here. Yeah. Um, now, my dad was in Chicago with us. Okay. And not with us, but he lived in Chicago. Um, and he was working for the American Hospital Association at the oh, time. Wow. And he jokes and tells people he had to take a job out there so he could get in-state tuition at University <laughs> of Illinois. But I don't know if that was necessarily the case. <laughs> Um, so anyway, we moved back here, uh, with the, you know, moved the kids back and, um, worked in the school of medicine. Unfortunately, the dean that I came to work with left after a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was kind of in limbo, even though I, I had a job and then the CEO at Mon Health at the time also had been in Chicago, and oh. I knew him from um, some Chicago. Small world. It is a small world. And then the chief operating officer position opened up over there, and wow. I went back, and um, I loved Mon Health. Loved the people. That's definitely my thing is being with people and operations. Yeah. Um, it was definitely a hard lifestyle once again. Mm. And I, I do have some regrets when I look back at some of the things I missed for my kids Mm -hmm. and not driving them to school, not being there at certain school events. Your biggest worry as a working mom is, is like, is my kid going to be the only one at the book fair without any money? Yeah. Because I forgot to send it. Yeah. Oops. It was today pajama day and he's not wearing pajamas and everybody Mm -hmm. else's. Yeah. 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 Or like he forgot his lunch Mm -hmm. and um, you know, you had to pre-order hot lunch or whatever at the preschool. And I'm like, okay, so you're just not going to give him lunch? Like, I don't understand. You let my child starve. Yeah. Can I just, like, bring a stock and put it in your yes, classroom Sam's and then club. you can feed him when I forget? Yes. No, but it's true. And, and, and we were talking about this before we even hit the record button, but I had heard you – a video of you that was very good, a, a panel that you moderated about, Thanks. yeah, uh, female executives in healthcare leadership mm-hmm. in particular and how underrepresented that population is. And and then I chimed in with, and that's across the board. That's not just in healthcare. Right. We're seeing that in all industries. And I, I think probably 
a lot of assumptions might be made about why that is, why we don't see more females uh, in executive roles. But I would like to just hear your personal perspective on that, too, and, and what that experience has been like as a female executive. Yeah, I think it's interesting because if you look at the student enrollment for MHA programs, the master's in you know health administration, mm -hmm. the majority of the students now, I mean, there's still a lot of males, but they are females. Wow. Um, but unfortunately, we don't cater to working moms. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> while being a mom isn't for everybody, yeah. there are a lot of people out there. And I think we miss some really good talent because women feel like they have to make a choice. Yes. And it was something that I didn't totally understand mm -hmm. when I went into it. I don't ever regret having kids. I made the right choice. Yeah. But you have to give up things. Yes. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, your kids are your priority. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, though, because that's what I was facing probably more in Chicago than here. But also since I've been here, COVID happened. And I think that mm -hmm. if there was one silver lining in COVID, yeah. it was giving people flexibility to work remotely, mm -hmm. work hybrid, and also get the job done. Yeah. And I've actually always had that philosophy, um, even when I was managing in hospitals, is if you're getting the job done, mm -hmm. I don't care if you need to leave at 3 o'clock to right. go see your daughter's play. Yes. But there are times, and I've lived it because it's definitely at least the world I grew up in management was mm -hmm. a man's world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it had traditionally been men. Um, I think when I did the fellowship, there were other um, male students there that were fellows who have been very, very successful, but they have stay-at-home wives. Mm -hmm. And there are many times that, um, not as much anymore, my kids are now 18 and 15, but <clears throat> I still, to this day, if I, I have my phone mm -hmm. and I have it turned over so I can see it, yeah. I don't answer it, but if it's a school calling, mm -hmm. I will just stand up and step out of the meeting. Yeah. Because you just don't know if something's wrong. Right. And I won't say to everybody in the meeting, oh, I have to step out because it's a school. Yeah. Um, I literally remember having something happen in Chicago where um, my son has asthma and the nanny texts calling or texting and saying, you know, he was having trouble breathing and they were going to go oh to the gosh. hospital. And I just stood up, but I never said, oh, my son is having trouble breathing. I said, I am so sorry, but I have to go. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame that we can't just be honest and about explain it. explain why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think the same thing happens in hospitals. We don't see as many physician executives hmm. because, especially if you're a surgeon, mm -hmm. Um, you're in the OR all day. So a lot of the meetings have to happen at 6 and 7 a.m. And okay. that was part of being a hospital administrator that you have to do. Mm -hmm. So all the medical staff meetings are either 6 or 7 a.m. or dinner time. Wow. And so a lot of women just don't step up to mm -hmm. be physician execs because mm -hmm. they think, I can't get there for a 7 a.m. meeting. Right. Well, we have to figure out a way kind of to work around that. And now maybe with Zoom and that kind of thing. It's yeah. it's different, but it's been a traditional problem. That I mean, men are overrepresented in those. Right. Absolutely. Well, and you brought up something that I think is interesting in, in terms of when you have children, obviously that becomes the priority. But I think the real challenge is, especially when you're in these executive level roles, the expectation from a corporate perspective is that certainly that job is a priority to you. Yes. You're in a big job, <clears throat> you're, you're, serving a very valuable purpose in the organization. And there's an ex expectation that you will be there. You will yes. show up for the six or seven o'clock meeting. That's part of the job. Yes. Especially when you're managing frontline employees mm -hmm. too, because if you have frontline employees that absolutely need to be there. So we were talking about some jobs you can do hybrid, some yeah. you can do remote. If you have to be at a front desk of a physician clinic because yeah. you're checking in patients, you're collecting right. co-pays, you have to be there. Mm -hmm. So you as the manager or the director or whatever are, are having to um, talk to somebody about the fact that they're late every day or they're taking too much time off. Mm -hmm. And then you are watson in at nine or 10 o'clock because yeah. you, you know, had to deal with your kids uh -huh. that morning. And they're like, what about me? I have kids right. too. Even though you have a job that you're probably going to stay until nine o'clock yes. at night and you don't actually get to take a lunch because you're have so many meetings and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's just the perception. And if yes. you want, I feel like personally, if you want people to respect you, mm -hmm. um, you have to be willing to do what they do. Yeah. 
I think, you know, the, the girl women thing is interesting. I, I have a daughter. I know you just have a son. Um, so you probably haven't experienced this firsthand, but maybe personally, mm -hmm. there's a, um, article out there that I highly recommend called if life were grade school, girls would rule the world. Oh, very, very good article. Okay. And it helped me a lot when my daughter was in middle school because, um, it basically talks about how girls, when they're younger, are leaders. Mm -hmm. They take charge of everything in pre-K and kindergarten and grade school. They're bossing people around. They want to be in the school play. And yeah. it really resonated with me because in fifth grade, um, my kids were at St. Francis. My daughter, we went to the St. Francis uh, play, and my daughter was literally the lead role. Like, we had no idea. We knew she had a role, but <laughs> we're like... Who, who is that? How did that happen? And she was so bold and funny. Aww. And I mean, everybody was just like, wow. Yeah. I could, the minute I think puberty happens and kids start to change, mm -hmm. girls get very self conscious mm -hmm. and they get very unsure of themselves. They don't want to be in front of people. Um, they're, they question themselves, the confidence, social media is added to yeah, that because yeah. it's so hard to be a girl these days. Yes. Well, boys get testosterone. Yeah. And they all of a sudden start to say, like, I'm taking charge yeah. and I'm not insecure. And um, it's just this thing. And I think we as moms tend and teachers mm -hmm. tend to praise our kids for being pleasers. Yes. Yes. And, oh, for sure. I call those yeah. the good girl messages. A yes. good girl does this, a good girl does that, and then yeah. it's, you know, a good mother does this, a good woman does that, you know. And I'm a pleaser. I, I am mean, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I was always a pleaser. Always yeah. wanted to make the teacher happy, yes. and that's my daughter. Not at home, but in, <laughs> it, outside of the house. Right. <laughs> she's very much a pleaser. Mm -hmm. And I praise that. I come home from a parent yeah. student, you know, a parent teacher conference and they say oh your daughter's wonderful and blah 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 and I go home and you know and I praise right so we keep you know but that's because she doesn't ask questions she doesn't push back yes she doesn't challenge anything yeah and I think that's um that's kind of where we are with it but there is a lot of research and that's a great article for trying oh, to understand see that because I think it's something that um uh, I worked on this initiative called West Virginia Women Forward um, uh, through the university, but it was a lot of people throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And we looked at articles like that, talking about how to educate, especially the K through 12 teachers mm -hmm. and um, really talking to them. And we actually there were some interviews that went on where they actually interviewed K through 12 teachers. And some of the teachers said, well, I, like in math, I don't really call on the girls because I don't want them to feel bad if they're wrong. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, there was all this stuff about boys get called on more. Yeah. Wow. Um, I know. It's very, very interesting, but yeah. it's true. And if you have a young child and they you went through the whole justice phase and all the shirts mm -hmm. and they have bling, like all the girls' shirts will say, like, I'm pretty like my mom. <laughs> And the boys' shirts say, I'm smart like my dad. Gosh. I mean, we just, like, yeah. encourage it. Well, like, remember the Barbie math is hard. Yes. I'll never forget that. That yeah. was the same thing. Mm -hmm. That was actually talked about in one of those articles. Yeah. Yeah. And I we, I that. bought those T-shirts for it. Like, oh, yeah. I contributed to it. Absolutely. But I didn't even think of it that way until, mm -hmm. you know, I really started looking into it and then look, looking back. I still praise her for being a pleaser. So I'm not sure it changes kind of who we are. But the awareness piece of it is really important, I think, just even being consciously so aware. I remember I read a book one time that they said about age 10 is the way it was framed in the book is mm -hmm. where girls go from knowing who they are to becoming who they are told they should be. Yep. And I that really stuck with me mm -hmm. of starting to just think about my own journey of how how, you know, when I was a kid, my dad's nickname for me was Tigress because I actually had a really fiery yeah. personality and he would tell me, call Calm down, tigers, calm down. You know, that was yeah. it, which is funny. I just realized I'm wearing a shirt. You that are like, wearing <laughs> a tiger shirt. <laughs> wow. Now I, I get, get it. it. That's it. <laughs> now but I get then it. I think for many, many, many years, I really turned down that part of my personality because it didn't seem ladylike. It didn't seem, yeah. and it certainly didn't match the pleaser model. And so it's, you know, up until I think, you know, 30s and 40s, I started realizing, wait a second, let's, 
Yeah. Investigate that and maybe we should bring her back. <laughs> right. And it's hard to bring it back. Yeah. And, and it's hard working with a girl that age. But it's funny you brought up the tiger and the cheetah thing because there's a book called Untamed. Yes, that's the book Glennon that I'm Doyle. referencing. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. And I loved that book. Yes, I mean, me I too. really sometimes, sometimes when I feel like I need a reminder mm-hmm. of how to prioritize things for myself, mm-hmm. I go back and listen to that book on audio tape when yeah. I'm driving. Yeah. It's a great, great book. Yeah. And it'll really, <clears throat> I think, challenge your thinking on, on all kinds of things. I mean, mm-hmm. she covers a lot of topics in that book that I think really, for me, it was a very reflective, and there's even a journal that that came later oh, that has really? all kinds of questions that's really good. Oh, I need to look that up then because mm-hmm. I haven't listened to that. Yeah, I, I need really to. Good. Yeah, I need to get that and read it or put it on audio. Yeah, but just <clears throat> thinking, I think a lot of times, and 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 boys too. Boys can, you know, as a mom of a boy, it's you know, boys can't cry, and I yeah. would get really mad about that because I'm like, well, wait a second, he's just the kind of kid that. All of his emotions come out through his eyes. Yeah. That's just how he is, you know. And and I used to get really frustrated with when he would get, you know, upset mm-hmm. about losing a game or something. He would cry, and people would say, you know, Laura, you have to stop that. He can't. He can't do that. And I'm like, but if he was a girl, nobody would right. even say anything about it. Like, why right. is it because he's a boy, he's not allowed to cry about I know. something that mm-hmm. it's a it's he's feeling it's an it's a real expression of emotion. Yeah. And why are we telling him you're not allowed to feel that? that is a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? and there's that old, um, oh, what was the movie, Major League with Tom Hanks and... Um, oh, um, and yeah, she, No Crying in Baseball. No League Crying of their in own. Baseball. Yeah, League, League, League of their, of their own. own. Yeah, there's Thank No you. Crying in Baseball. Yeah, and that's, yeah, everybody still says that. There's No Crying in Baseball yeah. and you're like, but you can cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a lot of that just conditioning that's going on that, that we don't we don't always have an awareness to. If it, yeah, I think the thing I like too about what Glennon Doyle says is, and this applied to me so much with community engagement and everything I do, and I try to, um, I mean, I'm very type A, I'm very driven, Mm -hmm. and I have to do everything. So I have to do my job well, I have to do the kids well, Mm -hmm. I have to do, you know, I I don't want to forget the book money or the lunch, and I want to be involved in all these organizations. And then the minute they realize you're a sucker and you can't say no, you're the president of the board (laughs) and, you know, the chair of this and the chair of that, and you're on these committees, and and it just gets around. It spirals quickly. And it spirals out of control, (laughs) and you're like, I don't know what happened. Yeah. And, um... But she says in the book, and I don't know if you remember this, but um, she's talking to her partner, and her partner is totally different. Like her partner yes. likes to lay on the couch. Yes. Well, she works very hard. Yes. But, but when she comes for her downtime, yeah, she lay, wants to lay on the couch. She wants to watch TV. Yeah. And Glennon Doyle was saying, like, I'm literally walking around, fuming in my head, like mm-hmm. stomping, and but not saying anything, no. being very passive aggressive. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is me. This is totally me. must be nice. Must be nice you, you can lay on the couch. <laughs> yes. Must be nice. <laughs> yes, totally. Uh-huh. And that's that's what she was saying. Like, must be nice that you don't have anything to do. And uh-huh. literally, like, her partner's perspective was, we can do it tomorrow. Like, it's yeah. not due today. Whereas I'm literally the person that's like, why would we wait till tomorrow? Why don't we just do it today yeah. and check it off? Yes, yes. And then she said she finally, and it sounds like those two talk, like they have a very good talking it out. Yeah. And um, she says at the, I just realized like at the end of life, at my funeral, nobody talks about I got a prize because I suffered the most. Yes. Do you remember she yes. said that? <laughs> yes. And I really like thought back mm-hmm. to myself. I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I do suffer. I do it to myself though. Oh, for sure. My plate is so full. And it's like at the end of the day, somebody's going to talk about an impact I made on a child, yeah. some public health initiative that I changed in the state of West Virginia. Yeah. That, um, you know, we were able to get needles, you know, the clean needle exchange program. I know that's like a political issue. Yeah. Um, but I, I, nobody's going to say like, oh, she served on 10 boards. She didn't actually do anything. She just served <laughs> on the board. She could barely she sure make it to the yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah, she could barely make it to the meeting. She didn't attend her kids sporting things, but yeah. she she did a lot. Yeah. Um, so I think about that a lot because I also think about ever since I moved back to West Virginia, Um, going from corporate hospitals into public health Mm -hmm. really made me think about 
what is your legacy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what is it that when you leave, if you're going to work this hard? Yes. What is your legacy at the end of the day? Yeah. What do you want to be remembered Mm -hmm. for? And I love that you bring that up because I do think sometimes we can get sucked into all of these things and it's, you know, hustle culture and however you want to look at it and we're in the motive and the intent is good i want to help i mean you are very passionate about community engagement Mm -hmm. which is a fantastic quality about you and and you will be remembered for that i know but at the same time it's a good point about am i really prioritizing things the Mm -hmm. right way and are these commitments really serving that legacy or not right and we talk about a lot of things and so we talk about the fact that um you know, we don't have broadband in the whole state of West Virginia. So how yeah. can telehealth get out there? So mm-hmm. from a public health perspective, I mean, these are minor examples, but we have ways we could do it. We yes. could work through extension, through the university. They have extension offices in all 55 mm-hmm. counties. Um, maybe we put Wi-Fi in those. I'm sure they have Wi-Fi. Right. But maybe we set up like these telehealth things through that. We talk about these great ideas all the time, but we just mm-hmm. talk a lot. Yeah. And it's hard because we're all busy. Everybody has yeah, somebody has jobs. to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think that that's part of the problem. I mean, all you have to do is talk about a passionate cause. And I'm like, OK, mm-hmm. I'll do it. <laughs> Um, Tave Racy talked one day at a rotary meeting about the Child Advocacy Center, uh-huh. Lyon County Child Advocacy Center. What a great organization. Great organization. I'm yeah. on the board. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and, and I actually feel bad now on that one because I think at some point I'll be able to give more. But yeah. right now, um, being the chair for the partnership board this year and, you know, all my work with the chamber. Mm -hmm. I've already committed to being president of the board for the United Way next year. I was a past president for Rotary and still do a lot with that. Um, It just, you know, I I really am trying now to space things out so I can give it the time that it requires. Yeah. I've been blessed so at WBU, though, because um, Clay Marsh, Mm -hmm. Dr. Marsh and Dr. Jeff Coben, um, who I report to um, really support community engagement. That's great. And it's, it should, in theory, yeah, they should be. I'm glad they are. But based on the fact that this is a community-based system, right? wouldn't you want to be connected? Right. And working in the hospital, I yeah. mean, I couldn't just run out at lunch to you know, go to a Rotary meeting. And I always joke because most of the people in the room for Rotary, our Rotary Club, aren't working. They're retired. Yes, yes. So they want to sit and hang out and have lunch and they give me a hard time because I run in late, (laughs) don't eat, listen, leave. And the whole time I'm on the phone. Um, But, I mean, it is, they actually, service above self just really resonates with Mm -hmm. me with Rotary. Mm -hmm. And I I do say, even though I just wanted to give back because of the, what they gave me for being an exchange student, it's a great organization. It is a great organization. And do I recall that you've had exchange students? Have you had exchange students? I did. Yeah, you have very good memory. So we took a boy from Brazil. Wow. um, In... Oh my goodness, I think he left, he left in 18. He was 17, 18, 2017. Okay. Unfortunately, though, in Morgantown, we just can't get host families anymore. Yeah. So he was with us for a year. <clears throat> Great kid. Everyone warned me, like, oh, this kid's from Brazil. He's going to come here and want to party. He's a high school student. You're going to have your hands full. <laughs> I'm like, he was a great kid. Aww. I wanted him to go out more than he did because, wow. you know, experience yeah. American high school. But it changes your family dynamics. Oh, for sure. And it wasn't that I didn't want him for the year. He would have experienced different kinds of American families. So look at me. I'm like, I don't cook. I'm not even home by the time dinner is there. I always joke and say, like, if you wait long enough, they'll eat a bowl of cereal. (laughs) It's a good strategy. (laughs) It really is. Always have cereal in the pantry. Uh Yeah. And then you're off the hook when you get home. Exactly. But no, I, and I always said to him, I'm like, listen, other American families, like a lot of them sit down to dinner. They yes. have very traditional lifestyles or yes. one of the spouses stays home. And that's just not the case here. Yeah. And um, and I kind of did it when my kids were younger. And I wish I'd waited till they were in high school so that they could have 
gone with him and introduced yeah, him to people. Yeah, been a similar, close in age and all of that. Yeah, it was. And thank goodness he did it the year before COVID because oh. then the exchange program shut down and kids, like, even if they had just gotten here, they had to leave. Oh, I can't even imagine. Yeah. It wouldn't have been a good experience it, had he stayed anyway if it was during COVID. I totally, mean. because he's learning remotely. <laughs> and a big part of being here when you're from Brazil is yes. you're learning the English language. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and for me, going to Australia, I mean, that was the main reason I picked Australia was... <laughs> Like, wait, I'm going away for a year. I'm going to need to them. I'm going to yeah. need for them to speak English. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This conversation was just too good for one episode. So join us next week for part two.